So wait, I, I forgot. Can we say fuck on this? Can we yes. swear? Yeah, Cole just <laughs> asked that. Yeah, I know. I, I totally, my mic exploded. So yeah, uh, you say whatever you I want. I got a little distracted. I got my trusty Nickelback cozy. Yeah. And you're not in a car. No, I'm not in a car. I'm in my kitchen, dining room. Look at, um, look at Kit's setup. That is amazing. That's like, Thank you. It's like $200 worth like, of brushes there. Just yeah. <laughs> microphone with a microphone. It could all be hand-me-downs. You know, who knows? Maybe one of these brushes painted one of the original secret paintings. Who knows? Oh, my God. I'm going to break into your house now and steal your brushes. Who's that? What's that behind you? Is that Alice Cooper? It's, it's, it's probably his yeah. girlfriend. Um, no, that was it just a hey girl. Hey girl. Um, oh. uh, Sometimes little, they hang uh, around and we paint their butt and leave it on our website. <laughs> <laughs> So to I have speak. a couple paintings of butts around here somewhere. <laughs> Me too. And I'm not even an artist. <laughs> um, men's butts, though. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> we don't judge. 2022, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. whatever. Whatever. Sexuality um, exists on a bell curve. It's fine. You're yeah. on a bell curve. I am. Well, Can I refill my cup of coffee real quick and then sit yeah, down? Do it. Yes. All right. Do whatever you need to do. You are the guest. Does that mean I can smoke real quick? Yeah. Yes. I won't take long. I probably should do that too. I'm just gonna do that here at my <laughs> See desk. Ya. See you, George. <laughs> Fuck you, George. See you, sucker. That "fuck you, George" from Cole is totally going in the podcast. All right, so we're ready. We are. Okay. I think so I got to come up with some sort of intro. This is always hard for me. Uh, <laughs> that's the intro. Welcome to the Secret Podcast. My name's George. I'm here with co-hosts uh, Brett Zingler and Cole May. Today, we're talking about the tribute hunt. Um, the podcast's always kind of shot away from the tribute hunt. We never really talked about it, aside from after it was first released. Um, but now we've got Kit with us. So we figured it's a good time on the anniversary of the tribute hunt to sort of see if we can't, maybe not breathe some new life into the hunt, but see if we can't come up with some some new and interesting ideas regarding it. See if we can't find out some of the background information. Um, Cole May is our newest official member of the podcast team. Uh, Brett and I haven't really worked on the tribute very much, but Cole has. Cole has um, been pretty active with the tribute, so we're going to let him sort of take us uh, through... Some questions about the tribute. We're going to let him sort of lead this interview with Kit Palancar. Uh, so, Cole, what do you got for us, man? Well, uh, you know, it was interesting. When you guys first asked me to do this, I um, I went ahead and I picked out like three or four um, like super active people in the, in the tribute hunt. And uh, I'll say their names. And if you want to bleep them out after, obviously you can. But shout out to uh, Rich Blanchford, uh, uh, James Van Eerden, and of course, my best friend, boyfriend, Nicholas Kanick, for the information. Um, Wait, he's you know, my I, boyfriend, too. Hey, you stay away, buddy. And, uh, you know, the, the really the only question I asked him wasn't so much like, where are you looking and all that kind of stuff. Because I think overall, the, the general location of the tribute cask is, is pretty much agreed upon. Whether or not it's right is totally a different question. But um, and uh, I more so wanted to know, like, what was kind of the approach that people took when it came when it first come out? You know what I mean? And um, for the most part, they were kind of all the same ideas but with a few tweaks here and there uh you know and it was uh it was really cool to talk to a few of these people so you know a lot of the ideas that i got were that you know people were picking apart uh individual tributes to individual parts of each puzzle right so people would say well this looks like charleston or this looks like it has something to do with you know uh um cal you know san francisco or whatever right uh this first line sounds like this one from this particular verse like there was a lot of comparison to the actual uh secret puzzle before it seemed like there was any so, like real solving going on right like any kind of theorization on location or anything like that and uh you know so it was it was really cool because um a lot of work was put into kind of seeing what was in tribute to what right in the to the rest of the puzzle sort of thing right yeah totally i i and i think um george you 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 know the origin of this but i i was one of the first people to jump in uh with a group of people that i was uh working with that was called we called ourselves the jewel box but um you know i i just sort of 
I worked on it for a little while and then things went squirrely for me. So I, I, uh, you know, had to refamiliarize myself with it, but I think George, you, you, you were around when JM first conceived of this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, the, the story of the conception, at least, um, uh, from my point of view, um, was when we first started doing the podcast, there, we only did like five or six episodes and we were, uh, JM and I were approached by a, a TV production company and they were super interested in making a TV show so much so that we like filmed a pilot and stuff. It was, it was a little crazy. Um, interesting to say, but I'm a 36 year old single father. I'm a firefighter and a treasure hunter. Like this is. This is what treasure hunters look like. It has all the elements of a great adventure. It is definitely Indiana Jones meets uh, National Treasure with a little bit of Goonies mixed in. Generally, the first question you get asked, are these things real? We know that. Two have been found, 10 remain, and John and I are trying to find them. John and I completely disagree with the, the, the vast majority of the way this puzzle works. He kind of keeps things more based in reality and I kind of explore a lot of different avenues of could-be's and possibilities. George is probably making faces and laughing. He, that's his normal, I, you know, that's his normal yeah. MO. John is the kind of person that, that, that definitely thinks that he's a good puzzle maker. Um, John thinks that, that these, these puzzles are, are, are done very well. I do not. I think he tried to be a very good puzzle maker, but he was super bad at it. Um, and he gave us clues that just don't hold up to the test of time. Now, maybe he didn't think it would take that long for them to solve, but it has. Uh, he gave us clues like in St. Augustine, he, he wants us to look over tall grass. Byron, grass gets cut occasionally. I, I mean, we don't know these... if it's grass or if that's a metaphor or something. So this is, this is where George and I have a fun time with the puzzle. Right, but the man said grass. If you look at the Milwaukee painting, you see a man juggling some things. That painting doesn't have any latitude and longitude coordinates in it. So for a long time, nobody was actually sure exactly where that was until you look at the millstone, the walking cane and the key and realize that's Milwaukee. Time is not on our side with this puzzle. Uh, the visual clues that we have, they, they go away. Trees get cut down. Parks change dimensions. Uh, buildings get built on top of old parks. The one thing that John and I agree on is that teamwork will solve this. Yeah. So the, the, the important thing about the podcast is we wanted to bring more people together. For um, four years, we were missing pockets of information and we tried like hell to get them from wherever we could. You can join our groups. You can talk to us. A lot of people online like to work on this puzzle, but they, they don't necessarily put holes in the ground. Yeah. Um, our, our team, we put the holes in the ground. That's why it's exciting because the pressure's on, the race is on, and we have everything we need to do it. We've been working on this thing for so long, we just want it solved, finally. I just want to sleep at night. It'd be nice to sleep, but sound night sleep without waking up in the middle of the night going, it's that monument. One of the uh, one of the features of the TV show was each episode there would be something hidden in an episode, like something written on an arm, or like a something spray painted on the back of a building or something that would be a portion of a of a verse, right? And at the end of the show, you could take you you could find all, each of those things in the episode, put it all together, and you would have a treasure hunt from the show. Now the TV show kind of fizzled out. Um, it went a long time, but it kind of fizzled out. And uh, Jan, John just sort of took that idea and kept going forward with it. Um, we eventually got an interview with Joe Ellen, and, and he presented the idea of Joe Ellen of making like a, a hunt that was a tribute to Byron, um, to the original puzzles, just something to sort of continue it forward. Um, Joe Ellen offered to give us, uh, give him the cask. Um, to do it and he sort of went from there um the prelude was released I, I don't think john had a hand in the prelude i think it was done um he, he asked john hardipy to do it uh, that's right and yeah so john hardipy i think he came up with the text he came up with the um images he came up with everything and but yeah that's that's that was, sort of how that's sort of how the tribute hunt was was conceived it started as a as an idea for a tv show that we were going to do that never happened and sort of went from there Sorry. Kit somehow, uh, yeah. Kit, how did you get 
get involved? I, uh, well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here and thanks for uh, organizing this, George, and thanks for, uh, you know, Cole for, um, you know, asking some of these questions and, and Brett as well. Uh, I, I feel like I have a lapse in my memory of how I became involved in this. It all just like, if you asked me, I don't know, two or three years ago, if you thought I was going to be where I am right now, I wouldn't even have guessed it. Um, I feel like because you know i'm my i am who i am i'm my dad's son uh you know john wanted to it to be as authentic as possible and i can't even remember when and where john first reached out to me about contacting me for this but i was like yeah this is really this is really cool i have no idea what i'm doing because i've never done anything like this before but i've always looked at these paintings i've always tried to figure them out myself i was like you know maybe i'll learn something about the the original secret by doing this and so it kind of went from there and it happened uh, very very fast and i can't believe it's been what two years three years um since it was released yeah. mm -hmm. so does that answer the question i uh, yeah i can i can refresh your memory on some of that by the way yeah please please do so please do John, you were the um, only person I ever knew John to be nervous about contacting. Like he was super worried um, when he first sent you a message about doing this. Like everybody had to proofread his message so that he worded it correctly. I know he he said that you guys were friends on Facebook since you were like 14. He was like, you guys were friends forever. Um, and but you never really talked. And he was like, now that I have this cast, he's like, I want to I want to incorporate since I have a, something made by one artist from the secret, I want to incorporate other artists. Um, and he was like, I wonder if, I wonder if Kit would do it sort of as a way to be involved in something his dad was involved in, right. Sort of carry on that legacy. And it took him a long time to, to form that, that first message to you. But yeah, that's, it, it was crazy. Like I said, he, it's, it's the only time I've ever known him to be nervous to contact someone. Really? I can't believe yeah. he's nervous to do that. I'm I, uh, super nervous. Super nervous. I'm he was saying, like, and then you get to know me and I'm an open book about yeah, pretty I'm, much anything. I'm nervous right now looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> it was so weird. Um, he, he was just, he was so sure he was going to blow it. He was like, this is, it's just like, I'm this old dude um, messaging <laughs> this young artist about a project that his dad did. Like he was so sure he was going to blow it and he only had one chance to get it, get it right. It was nuts. I feel like other people had talked to me about doing something, uh, you know, some sort of idea or, you know, to bring me in on something and, and nothing, I feel like nothing really transpired with anybody else. And then I don't, I don't know why I feel like I didn't necessarily choose John, but John chose me. Um, and it just happened very, very naturally. I think yeah. there, there wasn't any point when I felt uh, uncomfortable or, you know, weirded out. I had people asking me questions about the secret that my dad worked on. And I had, I, I couldn't answer, you know, too many questions because I just didn't know. And I still don't know. Um, and I think that's maybe how I got to know John was through, you know, that. And Yeah. Uh, John had a way of bringing people in. John had a way of making things really interesting and really meaningful and bringing people into him in, in, in a meaningful sort of way. Can we yeah. talk? I, and I know I realized obviously like I've already, when I was first forming these questions, I threw the idea of ever asking anything that would imply we want to know where anything is. Cause obviously you're not going to say those things. <laughs> and frankly, I wouldn't want you to. So I threw that idea out entirely, but I do want to sort of talk about the creation, like the, the, the context or whatever, and the creation of the tribute hunt. Uh, from the point at which you got involved kind of thing. Um, like you said, it seems like a pretty natural idea to have brought you in, you know, as opposed to like Banksy or somebody, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> to do something like this, like if it wasn't you, it wouldn't have worked. It wouldn't have happened. Right. Um, so let's, let's, let's paint a scene here. Um, you're, uh, this is 2019. Uh, JM gets a hold of you, says we're doing this tribute to the secret. You want to get involved. Uh, so you agree to it and now it's time to develop image and verse and all that kind of stuff. Um, is that how it went or was it, you know, 
I want to do the image, like you're saying to him, I want to do the image, you do the verse, are you know, are you able to say at all, you know, how far your um, reach into the creation of the tribute went? Was it as far as just the image? Or, you know, did you have a hand in lots of the other stuff as well? That is a very terrific question. Uh, it, I mean, just because it released in 2019 doesn't mean we weren't working on it months prior to that, uh, right. if not years. Um, and so how the process would kind of go was, you know, we would look at uh, um, references to not only the original, uh, you know, 12 paintings, but also to the references that were used throughout art history, different artists doing different paintings that have certain symbolism in them or are tied to certain kings from certain countries that have an influence on the uh the culture that is from that that area like uh you know the the dutch painting in the original secret has a very rembrandt vibe you know it's about the dutch immigration and rembrandt is a dutch painter and so it's got that kind of mood to it um so there were there were certain things that uh were researched and looked at first and um i think it kind of started out as um you know i'm the artist i do what i do and john is going to be the the writer he does what he does and there were points when we would um you know mesh together and uh I would do some sketches. I would send him some, some things. He would write some stuff. He would send me things. And I, I think there was one point when we tried telling each other what should be in each other's thing. Like I was like, you know, maybe I'll write a line or something and see where you go with it. And then he would give me an idea of about what the painting should look like or what he wanted in the painting. At one point it was um, uh, the one of the original concepts for the painting was to have this wall of uh, like mounted trophies with different pieces from uh, either different paintings or different locations for uh, the, the tribute. And I remember talking about that and, and showing him an idea and I would be honest with him and say, Hey, this isn't really flowing well with me or, uh, you know, this is straying too far from what I think it should be in terms of an artistic direction. Um, and then John would write things and send them to me. And uh, I, I, I don't know, everything he wrote was always so good. And he would hide certain things in what he would write. And I would be like, well, that's pretty cool. Or, hey, that's too much. You know, maybe we should tone that back a little bit. And he would say the same thing to me. He'd be like, that is way too obvious get rid of that or change it up. And there were some things that we talked about where we're like, I, we, is anybody even going to find that? Or, uh, you know, something like a little Nick in the paint turns into this big thing. That's not actually a thing. So, uh, that's, I hope that answers your question on that. Yeah. So it's safe to say then that the, like the creation of the verse and the creation of the image sort of were hand in hand, right? Like one, um, like they influenced each other's creation to the point where eventually the final product was kind of honed down between the two sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And it was really interesting when the images were being sent to John and John was sending me verses. The really tricky part was finding out how it's cause the, the verse and the, the painting might, you know, pair in some way, but there needs to be uh, um, uh, some very, very subtle way of doing that. It can't be too obvious. It can't be too literal. Um, and there are some things that just exist in the verse, and there are some things that just exist in the painting, and then there are some things that need to be uh, meshed together in order for it to be one whole piece. So yeah. let me... Let, let me ask real quick, just bouncing off of that. Um, we find a lot in the secret that people focus on the paintings as a way of, of solving the hunt, um, sort of exclusively using the painting, right? Um, are you, ha, you having said that, does that mean that 
the tribute hunt is not that way. Like if I were to take the verse away from the tribute hunt and just present someone with the painting, they would not be able to find this cask. Correct. And, and vice versa. If I were to take the painting away and just give them the verse, they would not be able to find this cask. Correct. Yeah. Gotcha. Do you have any like puzzle making experience? And a uh, second part of that question is, did you guys run some of this by anybody and go, wow, what, you know, we're so enveloped in this thing. You know, what do you guys think? Uh, I have zero puzzle making experience, but I have completed a lot of puzzles and I like puzzling things. I guess <laughs> if that's a thing. I love uh, troubleshooting. I love figuring things out. When I was a little kid, I would, uh, and I mean, little as in, I don't know, I'm five, six, seven years old. And I have a brother who is four years older than I am. And he is super into the tech world. Um, and we would, you know, take apart boom boxes and VCRs and put them back together. And then you figure out how different things work. So I've always been interested in, in puzzles and things like that, but I had never created one. Uh, what was the second part of the question? I'm so did sorry. You, did you check, did you check your progress with any outside party and say, Hey, how are we doing here? The only person that I attempted to check with, and I say attempted because I didn't get very far, was my dad. And he um, maybe helped me just a little bit in terms of cool. how to distort certain things. But he said very, very a minuscule amount uh, of what John and I came up with together. And that was because uh, my dad told me that it's my thing. You know, it's it's my thing with John. And he is trying to respect that. And also, I feel like he's holding on to some things that he didn't want to tell me for, you know, for reasons. Like, are you able to explain sort of the extent of the, like, how deep the word tribute actually goes? Like, can you, how much of the book did you pay tribute to? Or was it just like the concept of the book that it was paying tribute to? Was it a like a you know a, a specific comparison, or was it more of a conceptual kind of comparison? Are you able to answer that? I I think so, but I feel like some of it might be assumption, and I'm hoping George can help me on it because you knew John a lot better than I did. I think that because I have never read the book, The Secret, I was always enamored with the images. I would always stare at them and I would, you know, read the verse. I never read any of the historical part with the, uh, the fair folk and, um, everything like that. So, but I assume that John did. And I, I feel like he definitely utilized that more. Um, I, I don't know if it's, if it was ever a requirement that you had to read the book in order to be able to solve the, the John the once John once gave an interview where he said that um, knowledge of the book of the secret, certain aspects of the book of the secret would be very important to solving the tribute. Um, jo now, John was, he's a lot like me. Like he didn't really like the back of the book. He thought it was kind of cheesy and lame. He thought it not lame. But he thought it didn't have any any aspects. <laughs> hey, he hey, thought watch it didn't it. have any yeah. Lame. It didn't have any real <laughs> impact on the puzzle in general. Um, if if I had to answer that question, I would say like you should pay attention to the front of the book. Um, I think that will help you with the tribute immensely. Mm. Interesting. Um, well, I, I never thought it was uh, uh, necessary, so I never read it i always left that up to uh john john i feel held my hand through a lot of this stuff that i was either completely uneducated about or i had no idea was even a thing yeah. and so i kind of leaned on him quite a bit in terms of direction i feel like i was there as the the artist and creator of a, a composition and you know, trying to hide things in it. And a lot of it was um, in terms of the image part done on my behalf. And John really helped me out through a lot of the other things. He would explain to me certain things about the original that were 
he wanted in the tribute. And so I think uh, the, the, the tribute kind of tries to encompass all of that from the original secret in a very <clears throat> condensed format. To, to, to sort of expand on something you said, um, a long time ago, we spoke back when you were first uh, starting the tribute painting. Um, you said that your role in the tribute was was more of a tool than anything, that you, you were the painter and that's what you wanted your role to be. But throughout the process, it seemed to become more personal for you. It seemed to, you, you, you put yourself into it more and it, um, it just became more personal. At what point did, did, did your feelings change from, I just want to be the painter of this to, I want this to be part of something I'm known for, or I want this to be a part of my legacy as a painter. I think it really changed after it came out and to see all of these people immediately start to work together on something that John and I created that I had some sort of hand in some sort of role in. It was really humbling and it was extremely touching. And uh, it just was such a good feeling to be a part of a project that, you know, especially when people would post photos of themselves out with their families, their children, you know, their parents, whatever. And you, you get to learn a sense of uh, history. You get to learn something about an area that you might never even have researched before had you not known about the, the tribute or the, the secret. And that was one of the more rewarding things. That's when it, you know, it became <laughs> personal. The, the painting was done in a relatively short time. So it's not like that it became personal when I was painting it. Uh, but it never felt like a job ever. It never felt like a commission. There was always some part of it that was from within. And then it really became personal after it came out. What was it like? And I guess if you're able to describe kind of the, when it, like the point of when it got there, but like when you decided you were satisfied with the image, you know, and brought it to JM for what would end up being the last time, you know, what was that kind of like? Like, was that all done in tandem? Like, did he call you one day and say, dog, I got the verse. And then you say, dog, I got the image. Like, this is crazy. Let's get together and, and put them together and see what we got. You know, like, was that, or did it just sort of flow organically into that? And then naturally it's just, there you go. And I also have a B side question of this, but I'll, I'll wait until you're done answering the first one. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Because I love I love questions, and sometimes I get so far ahead of myself, I forget the other half of the question. That's cool. Or I go off on some tangent that is about something completely unrelated. I think I get that from my dad a little bit. The guy <laughs> never stops talking. Um, it flowed very smoothly. It was never an abrupt transition from. Uh, Hey, this is done. This is done. You know, put them together. It was always we were we were always conversing back and forth about the verse and the painting, and there were you know I'd send him in progress shots of the painting, and he'd be like, "Hey, move this around or change this," and so it, it was worked up until the day it was released. I took pictures of the painting while it was still wet, and then those are the pictures that were you know uploaded and, and posted. So that part happened pretty quickly but leading up to it it was very very smooth nothing abrupt okay so my b-side question was um so the whole process flowed very organically to get us the tribute puzzle as we now as key searchers have it um and you know if one builds the other sort of thing it gets to a point like were you at the very end and this is sort of like a be as honest as you want kind of question but at the end, were you ultimately satisfied with the image that you produced or like, are there things that you wish you could have added or, you know, like, do you look at it now three years on and say, like, I kind of wish I had done this or, or like, is it like, I get the feeling of being a hundred percent satisfied with a project. Right. But is there ever a time where you're like, shit, I wish I could have maybe put this there or, or so was there ever that conversation, you know, after the tribute was put out, 
you know, not just with you personally, but anybody else. Yeah, that was a conversation I had with myself many times and John uh, a couple times. And I feel like I, I maybe mentioned it to George. Uh, I, I had always wondered why my dad said the secret paintings were some of the worst paintings he had done that he, you know, hates looking at them which if you didn't know that, it might surprise you too. And because I think they're, they're beautiful. Um, and there's certain things that are in those paintings that are, you know, still being used in terms of technique and maybe symbolism and hiding things, things that still make an appearance in paintings that he's done in the last five, 10 years. Um, absolutely, I, I think that the, the secret uh, tribute painting could have done been done differently there are sketches that i've done that are totally different things and not to say that i wasn't satisfied with the secret painting but there are a lot of things that i would have done differently um do you mean technique wise like in in how you did it rather than what you put in there that and also what i put in there or what i shouldn't have put in there and I do have plans to redo it at some point, something a little bit more true to uh, what I think an original secret painting should be. And that's the tricky part is thinking about how much you pull from the original 12 and how much you do on your own. And that was the really tricky part that I, could have, I feel like done better. Some of the original paintings are only, you know, like the, the size of this one behind me, which is 16 by 20 or something even smaller. Like I think the, the Florida painting is only, uh, or Florida painting in quotes is only, you know, this big or something. It's really tiny. The tribute painting is three feet by four feet. It's 36 inches mm. by 48 inches. And so scale is definitely something that I would tone down on, but it's out and that's what people are looking at and that's what you have to roll with. So well, let, let me ask this. Um, the, I mean, the painting is gorgeous on its own. I, I, I like this painting. Thank you. Um, it, and it's, it's unique. It's you, you run the risk when you're doing something like this, of it just being a copy, like it just being a copy of your dad's work, you know, but this is unique. This is a kit palancar. This it's not a copy of a, of a John palancar. Um, no artist that I know of is truly happy with their work. Like, you know, 10, 10, 10 years, two years down the road, 10 years down the road, they're always like, oh, that sucks. I should have done it better. <laughs> so I'm, I'm wondering how much of, how much of your answer is, is that just that artists are finicky perfectionists and, and they can't see the beauty in their own work because they see the flaws that no one else sees. I think that's entirely true. And it's because you are always learning. I think that as a teacher, I learn from my students too. I will see techniques that they use that I've never seen before. And I'm like, oh, I'll try that in the studio. Or uh, they did something accidental and I won't necessarily tell them that what they did was cool, but I'll be like, okay, mental note of what they did. I'll, I'll take it <laughs> back. Uh, so I think over the course of the years, you learn how to handle things differently. You your eyesight starts to change about what you see and what you absor uh, absorb and what you observe as well and what you find is important. And the one thing that I've really learned over the years is less is more. And that's something that my dad would, you know, tells me all the time uh, when I'm either he's talking about his own paintings and I'm, or I'm critiquing his paintings and he's talking about design decisions and things like that. So, I think that is true and it has been a while since I, you know, have done that painting Yeah, and things, things change. I look at it differently. Why do you think it's been almost three years since this has been out and it hasn't been solved or, and, or why do you think it's so, do you think that this is a difficult puzzle? The difficulty of the puzzle is dependent entirely 
upon who is looking at the puzzle, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. I think that there are certain things that should be simplified or certain things that are right in front of your face, but that are overlooked entirely. And that's what's really funny is looking at some of the proposed solves and realizing that some people took the bait and that's okay. <laughs> I asked your dad a question once and he gave an answer ba almost exactly what you just said. I, asked him, <laughs> I was like, I was like, is there anything in the secret puzzles that people, the secret paintings that people haven't found? And that he was like, yeah, there's something that's staring you right in the face that you haven't found. Is there something in the tribute that you're surprised it, it's in the painting? Is there something in the painting that you're surprised people haven't found? Is there it's one a good of those, question. it's staring you right in the face things? I need to think about what people have posted. And I think there are some things that people have missed. But I'm not going to say how many, and I'm not going to yeah, say. Yeah, no, don't. No, please don't elaborate don't, on that. Any, anything more don't. like I, that? I got a couple of questions then that I can ask here. Um, so uh, earlier we talked about how the you guys did a podcast interview after the Boston uh, Expedition Unknown episode came out when, uh, like, they did the interview with Jason Krupat and all that stuff. And I have a couple of quotes from you that I want to talk about and. One of the reasons why I want to ask you about these is to see if you still think this way and, um, you know, see if you'll actually answer any of these. But um, <laughs> so, um, so, and this kind of leads into our discussion of, uh, of symbolism in a way, because uh, when you guys were talking about uh, the, the Boston painting in that particular picture, Kit had mentioned that, uh, and I'm going to quote you here, that it was told to you by the man, the myth, the legend, who was presumably at that point your dad, um, that uh, he's told you that images, like the images are, and this is a quote, images are where it's buried uh, and hiding in plain sight. So the picture is like, it's in there and it's in the picture. Is, the, is that sort of aesthetic or that idea applied to the tribute at all? Can you say that? Like, is the, is the image showing you where it's buried? Like a lot of people think the, the secret ones are? Did you say that in the Boston episode? That's crazy. How did I miss that? I uh, I, I don't know. I uh, plead the fifth on this one. Um, That's fine. That's no, fine. I, I think that... Uh, it, it, it tried not to be too obvious with the visual depictions, but I feel like you will, if you find all of the clues you will know where you are supposed to go mm. i think it's like a, a destiny thing like one thing that really is interesting to me and this sort of applies to both the you know like the secret the tribute and to you personally is that like comparatively and you've said this on on a few different occasions even just tonight here but um comparatively to your father your work is is and this is not a good or a bad or anything but comparatively your work is quite a bit more minimalist than uh jjp's work is right um three of my favorite pieces of yours are uh, marty it's your kids god's thumbnail and at the grave and in those pictures you have deliberate subjects and what i refer to as a passive background where if the background wasn't there really it, from a viewer's perspective not so much from an artist's perspective but if the background was any different it really wouldn't um change the message of the picture right um the tribute image compared to the secret images um and maybe this is part of the magic of the tribute is that given how like the JJP's pictures for the secret are quite busy, right? Like there's lots of stuff in those pictures and there's lots to look at and all that. And in the, in the tribute image, there's considerably less, right? Like, can we agree that that's, that's the case? I, I would think so in terms of, you know, stylistically speaking. Yeah. It's right. they're, they're simpler. Right. And yet you still achieve, you still have, and you still achieve the, you know, the puzzle aspect of, the same thing that that your dad did with the secret stuff right like there's still clues they still connect with the verse and the puzzle and all that kind of stuff yeah despite having quite a bit less imagery if you will um but also one thing i guess the tribute has just as a small caveat that the rest of the secret doesn't is 
important imagery in the, or and this is speculation from the community, is imagery on the verse page, right? Like that sort of matters, in a, or matters it seems, because people have found places where those things that are on the verse page are, right? Like the Christensen Fountain and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, and when it comes to the tribute, you know, um, I guess I'm like my ultimate question. And well, I guess the ultimate question from the community is that is how deep does that tribute go? And so with that last question, you know, like, is there that minimalism, um, you know, like, is that is that an intentional thing for you where you wanted to keep it, you know, Kit Palancar style? So you went a little more minimalist than John Jude Palancar style or? Great question. I, uh, I think that's where the uh, less is more thing comes into play where I always, uh, and that, this painting was done after I was in uh, grad school. So I feel like it was a vulnerable time, especially, uh, I'm saying that kind of as, as a joke, but in grad school, they kind of take what you know and what you've learned and they put it all into a blender and they blend it up and then you're force fed with a funnel, that same information. And so my artwork that I was doing before grad school during grad school and after are i feel like three completely different things so the the tribute painting was done pretty much right after grad school when i was still i don't want to say brainwashed but i was definitely thinking about imagery different and i went to a school where the abstract side of art and the it wasn't so representationally based it was more about conceptual art or uh, more minimal art that uh, and that's just the way contemporary art is going. You don't really see a whole lot of super detailed, like traditional art anymore. Like the days of Wyeth and uh, Edward Hopper and those sort of realist artists are kind of over. And so there were, there were some elements that were meant to be more based in, in representationalism and realism and then there were some elements that were based in more of this simplified style i mean i, I think it's important the tribute is a tribute to the original paintings but it's important that it be separate that this be kit palancar artwork that it not be a, a copy of of something something else like it it's it's Kit's it's life. It's Kit's art. Yeah, it's a tribute. It, it's important that it be Kit's art. It's important that it be in his style. Um, it's important that his message get across. That's uh, it's a good conversation to have, too, because I think if I were to redo it, or I should say when I redo it, I think that there are more elements that I would like to use that I've learned in the past few years, because I, I don't know, I've I've always loved my dad's style of painting which is taking a brush that's uh i don't know you you won't be able to see it on camera but you take a brush that's you know five hairs and some air as bob ross would say and uh you know you do thousands of tiny little strokes i feel like i'm not that patient of a person and that's just my <laughs> how i how i am and everybody's wired differently. So there are things that I just don't have the patience for. And maybe that's one of them where the style is different. And it, it, I will look at, you know, things like the original secret paintings and um, some things I will use, some things I won't. But if I do it differently in the future, I, I think uh, I think it would look drastically different than how it does now. That's something I could never get about acrylic artists like your dad. They paint in dots and cross hatches and make it so beautiful and so detailed in the end. But it's like, God, the amount of time that takes yeah. and, and yeah. skill to, to make a cross hatch that detailed. What's essentially a cross hatch that detailed. It's like a very fine, like weaving almost, yeah. you know, you're weaving these layers of transparent color over each other and they're each, you know, facing a different direction and you get the, sense of form and volume so it's crazy here's a question that came in from the uh, tribute <clears throat> facebook page and it's um where where is the cask buried <laughs> <laughs> well uh i think you go John to the texaco said, station and you make a right wait a minute 
I think John said in that last Christmas stream, it was in my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I, was... I got one from the community too, uh, from the most beautiful man in the entire community. He wants to know if the uh, if the painting is part of the prize. Oh, if the painting is part of, like, you find the cask, you get the painting? Yeah. Uh, do you get the painting? No, you don't. <laughs> you can buy it. <laughs> you can buy it or maybe an auction you'd in the future to, sometime. Right. You'd have to also buy that. Much, yeah. um, much like John Palancar told Andy Abrams, if you have $10,000, you can buy the tribute painting. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. No, good and, questions. And you find the cask and give Kit $10,000. There you go. That's how it works. That's how you, And I keep the painting too. Yeah. So. yeah. Oh, sweet. <laughs> Sounds like a sweet deal. Kid, I got um, a really good question for you. Brett, can I just cut in really quick? No, Sorry. cut in. If I don't ask this now, I'm going to forget it. So, Kit, you work on The Secret as well, right? Or you have in the past worked on the original Secret? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So was it totally cool when you were making the tribute to kind of sometimes step – like did you ever just sometimes step back and, and try to look at it as a person, um, you know, looking for the cask as opposed to the person burying it? Not really. And – it's not that I didn't want to, but I, I feel like I couldn't, if I was the one designing it, I feel like I could not separate, uh, myself from that. Even looking at, uh, the original, I, I feel like I can't, you know, look at those, like, you know, I, I didn't have some sort of hand in those. I mean, I didn't, but it's, you know, uh, growing up with the guy that did them, you know, you bring them out or you look at them at some point and be like, Hey, what's that? You know, you might get something you might not. <laughs> um, so Kit, we were talking about buying the people buying the painting. Um, a, the, one of the bad things about the secret paintings with your dad is he doesn't necessarily own the rights to them. He doesn't own total rights to them. He can't display them. He can't sell prints of them. Uh, but you own the rights to this painting and, and, and people want this painting. Um, do you have any, interests or plans in selling prints or anything like that of the painting? Absolutely. I would love to sell some more, you know, high quality physical prints. Cause I know people have, you know, maybe printed out their own copies or, or what, but um, no, those are definitely in the works for sure. Was there ever a point where you were working with jam on this thing and you were like, man, this is where this whole thing began. This, you know, I feel like, my dad and and byron right now sort of a sense of of lore i think when we got back in the car after it was uh in the ground and we were driving away i think that's when it like started to sink in like what have we done kind of <laughs> type thing <laughs> and uh, it it was really exhilarating can you talk about like just what it was like what that day was like without giving any locations obviously or anything like that but like can you describe the day you buried that cast getting in john's it was like, <laughs> yeah right right it was like any other day and it just uh the the day the night whenever it was took a interesting turn and you just put on your vests and you know, do the thing. Is Let that what you guys did? Like you did the whole fake workers' vests and all that kind of stuff. Tight. <laughs> I <laughs> still, dude, I still can't imagine John digging a hole. Like I could he, not force that man to dig a hole. <laughs> he uh, he wouldn't let me have any part in it. He just he did it all himself, and I was uh, kind of watching out, making some BS conversation about how we were collecting soil samples for our graduate school project, and we had to, you know, take them back to to the classroom and did people catch you digging that hole uh i don't know if there were any people around or not i can't probably uh, that's better a, that's, to, i can't, that's a good I can't answer, say yeah. <laughs> let, let me ask you this just just for just for me um thinking back because john's obviously no longer with us thinking back to all of your experiences with john not just not just with the tribute What's when you think of John, what's what's the favorite what's your favorite memory? What 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 comes to mind? <laughs> My favorite memory with John is when he was doing the audio for a band called Firefall. Oh I, I think. And <laughs> yeah. so 
he uh, had come into, he rented a car and it was like a Dodge Charger or something. It was like a, he got like the most American muscle car you could get. And it was purple and, uh, or it was like deep, dark silver. It was some very dark color. And I remember he had come into Starbucks where I was working at the time. And I think, I don't know if I took a, a break or not, but John had come in with like the lead singer of Firefall. And I never heard Firefall before. I never listened to them before. And I remember they both order something. I think I comp some part of their order, like a drink or a sandwich or something. And the lead singer of Firefall orders a sandwich. And I get like caught up with um, talking to John and the, the, the singer. And I, I wish I knew his name. I'm so sorry if he's ever going to listen to this. And I get so caught up in talking to them that I forget about his sandwich. And it's been like five to 10 minutes since he <laughs> ordered and they're just trying to go. But, uh, I eventually remember, and I, you know, apologize. I put on my customer service, you know, smile and then fix the, fix the problem. And it's later at night and my now girlfriend and I go see this firefall show. And at the end of the show, we're walking by and they're all signing. All the band members are signing posters and CDs and stuff. And I remember uh, I said hi to him and, you know, that was a good show and all that. And he's like, hey, where's my sandwich? You know, <laughs> something about the sandwich I forgot earlier. And you should have brought one. <laughs> you should have. Uh, but that was that was really funny. I, I think that uh, John had introduced me to a lot of different things and and um i'll always be thankful for that he got uh me and george into the uh backstage at a sticks show yeah that what? was awesome yeah yeah it's <laughs> pretty I mean, pretty sick oh it was awesome um especially to be backstage those are the if people don't know those are the mr mr roboto guy guys um we drank all their beer <laughs> yeah, we drank all their beer. Um, although we brought some alcohol for uh, some because we had been to the Bahamas or something like that. So we yeah. brought some rum or, or you did or I, I don't remember. But it was uh, like but Tortuga we, overproof. It was good. Dude, we ate like kings uh, where the band eats and drinks. And I mean, he styled us out. He didn't know who I was. He, dude, uh, he, George, go he invited me and Destiny down. He was doing a, um, a festival in Charleston called uh the high water festival or something this this lady that he was touring with uh oh god what's her name she's a she's an african-american singer dreadlocks is gorgeous gorgeous lady amazing singer can't remember her name um and he he placed me and destiny in the artist tent and we just hung out back there we like stole all of, um we all ate all of jason aldean's snacks uh, it was awesome yeah he he was really he was a good dude. He was a lot yeah. of fun to be around. I feel like he would cool. just get you into either really cool experiences or trouble if you hung yeah. out with him. Yeah, yeah. He told me like he's like the greatest hint you can or the greatest tip I can ever give you for a concert is just if you want to go backstage, just walk past security and if they say anything, just scream out, "I'm trying to fucking work here." And he's like, "If you if you do that, you can get backstage." <laughs> I've never. That was had one thing as long as you. <laughs> As long as you act like you belong, you can get yeah. into all sorts of places. What yeah. what you said there about being in trouble or having an awesome time, you just described the entire weekend I spent with him in New Orleans. Oh, we <laughs> were either it. having a, no, I mean, it's like uh, we were either having an amazing time or it was an absolute shit show. There was <laughs> a, unless we were sleeping, there was nothing in between. <clears throat> can I get can I get a beer refill? Yeah. And uh, is my lighting okay? I've been struggling with this light behind me. Yeah, you're fine. This is super foggy it, behind you. Like you just can't see it. <laughs> That's okay, right? It doesn't. It's not distracting. No. 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 Okay. I'm actually. Um, I'm gonna grab a drink too while he's grabbing a drink. I'm Everybody gonna go grab pee. a drink. Yeah. Yes. Can Let's I smoke? go to the bathroom? Drink, smoke. All right. In seven minutes. Seven Got minutes, it. guys. Got it. A few moments later. Is it just me, or does that in the background of? Kit's video. Does it look like that hoodie guy is stroking a giant plastic dong? It does. 
Hair. Is that a plastic dog? No, I think it's like a maybe a sponge. I don't know. Where is that? Jesus? Who is that? Look at the guy uh, in the hoodie. See his kay. hand, and then what's I in don't front see of it? A, I don't see a guy in the hoodie. The red, in the, like to the, the right red. of Dallas Cooper. Yeah, to the right of the his the red guy. Right. Okay. Oh, it's really hard. Okay, I got this. Just a little small. It looks like he's stroking a giant plastic said. dong. Wait. I think he, why does he have a plastic dong in a cup? <laughs> well, any artist, Brett, I don't know if you know this, but all artists have to have a plastic dong in their studio. Oh, it's, no, yeah, I didn't know like that. A, it's part okay. of the code. Okay, um, cool. I think I would fit right in. Wait Mine a minute. hangs from the roof. Mine Wait hangs from the roof. Oh, really? Yeah. Mine's uh, elsewhere. Do you guys know who I was talking about when I said the most beautiful man in the group? Probably yeah, Nick. Brett. Oh, no. no it was oh. Just, just in the nick of time. Ooh. Right? I cannot think of a better joke. <laughs> Good one. Oh, shit. That should be in the pod- podcast. Um, I used to do that, too, actually. I put Nick and Caroline in. I don't know if George knows noticed this or not, but when I first started, I would throw those guys into it. Uh, they're like they're like royalty. They're fun. Yeah, they're awesome. Did you know I, I spent the weekend with... um. Ashley, Ashley Ann, she's one of the mods in Dustin's group in Charleston. So one of one of the best times I've ever had. She's such a nice person. Yeah, she's rad. Yeah, yeah. I don't know her very well. Never met her in person, but um, she you, from you what I've seen, her. she's cool. You would she's love super, her and her husband. Super cool. Husband's she's great. a wicked good resource for Nola. Like her and Brody have worked no, New Orleans a lot, and regardless of your spot there, she can she can talk to you about it for fucking days. Okay, we so were, we're hitting we're, the <laughs> we're we're remarking on your plastic dong that you have in the background. Oh, what's uh oh this thing? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that thing. It is yeah. a dong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, um, cool. They are it's those a, are the uh the original Harmon Cardon sound sticks that were it looks even more like that guy's holding it now the starving artist thing is real very yeah, sure. very real it's real I, I, if i it, lifted it, on my shirt right now it'd be ribs and a spine yeah you and me both brother <laughs> that would probably could you do that that would probably get us more views on youtube if you could. it would but i mean if you subscribe to my top tier on patreon you might get that so oh do you have any tattoos I have no tattoos. I have really? zero tattoos. I have one piercing in my nose, and it's a septum piercing, and that is about it. I have. Have no you ever tattoo. had a tattoo? No, <laughs> I'm kidding. I've you never had a tattoo. I, I've always <laughs> wanted a tattoo. Uh, I've had about? ideas about tattoos, and I just Shoot. never have. Go get a gone tribute tattoo. It. Get the tribute yeah, image tattooed on you. Okay, the whole painting. That'd you should rad. get on your back, no, like the, Steve-O, Steve-O style, you should get a tattoo of you painting the tribute painting. <laughs> <laughs> when you guys were making it, like, were you, did you pay attention to the way that, like, to the community itself as it is now? Or was it more like, let's build this based on people thinking <laughs> about the original secret in the 80s kind of thing? Like, you know, did you did you look at Jason Olson's chart? Did you you know look at the theories people have about the secret and stuff like that, and then develop the the tribute hunt, or was it just basically we have this concept and we're going to build on it the way we see it? That is a great question. I did not. I, I don't think I really f- was a part of the community. I mean, I was a part of the community, but I never really you know, was actively working with people, I think, to, to generate solves or to look into things. And so I always like push that stuff to the back of my head. You know, it's always been there, but it's, it's not something I, I looked at and referenced frequently, which I think really aided in the tribute being not this, you know, heavily, um, uh, manipulated concept where we uh, look at what people are looking for and we do something completely opposite. I think that there are certain parallels between the original and the tribute that are happening naturally because it was, uh, I don't know, designed not, not with, uh, I don't want to say without the community in mind because it was for the community, but we definitely didn't, um, at least I didn't when designing the painting, look at, what people were saying or what people were thinking. And I'm like, oh, I'm not going to do that or whatever. I, just, yeah. I don't know. 
so did you actively stay away from the community while you were doing the tribute image or did you just that just wasn't something in your mind it, it was just something that was uh just an outlier i don't know yeah. like the community was there and you know we were doing it for the community and to to create something interesting but we weren't um like using the community in terms right. to generate this this tribute hunt to close out the tribute talk there was a question on one of the uh on the tribute page that i just kind of want to get in concrete just the answer in concrete right here um, you, you said before that um john did most of the work on the verse uh you did most of the work on painting i can assume from that 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 means you probably don't completely know how the verse works like you, you you could walk up to a place and dig this cask up i'm sure but you don't completely know how the verse works and i can assume that john didn't completely know how the painting worked um john has stated many many times that that no write-ins for this are acceptable no write-ins um for the tribute in order to solve the tribute you have to dig up the cask um is that applicable with you as well will you accept write-in answers I will not, nor will I imply that you are on the right track. But I also won't tell you if you're wrong either. I think that the puzzle is totally solvable, um, you, you know, just by reading the verse, looking at the, the painting. I don't, uh, I don't know what the, the solves um, – accomplish i guess you're sending me solves accomplishes because i'm gonna say no you know without a picture of the cask right 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 yeah. and but it is interesting to kind of see where people are or uh you know if they're on the right track or not or if i have to start um preparing myself for what to say if it's found um you know you kind of sometimes get like a little oh, they figured something out or uh oh they're they're way off or, or whatever um have you so, had those moments where people have figured something out and you're like wow that's you know like you can see it well yeah there there are some things that are designed to be dead on and mm -hmm. things that are designed to be um found and that's the thing though is they're designed that way yeah. they're symbols so, uh, it could go. It could go either way. Okay, let's play the game. Let's play the game. <laughs> game time. I'm excited for the game. What is this game called? Dum -ba -ba -ba. Symbols with Kit. <laughs> okay. Oh, and I want to give a real fun fact to anybody that doesn't know that's in the community that doesn't know a whole lot about Kit because I did a little bit of digging on this guy and and you don't actually have to dig really far to find this, but. Kit Palancar is known for his art. He loves doing art. Um, he's uh, he's a decent barista, from what I understand. Uh, he likes to cook sometimes. But one thing that Kit Palancar is all about that you might not know is frisbee. This guy plays frisbee a lot, and I didn't even hmm. know like like that game that you play with the the teeny cage things. I don't uh, even know what that's called. Is that just this golf? Frisbee golf. Okay, yeah. I've watched all your Instagram videos of you playing frisbee golf. And like, I don't know that you see Kit smile more than when he's chucking that disc. So there was there was a fun little trivia fact about Kit Palancar for you. Fun. I absolutely <laughs> love this golf, and I have a few buddies that it's always been a thing. I started playing it back when I was in high school, and I had one disc, and that was a disc that I'd found in the woods. It wasn't even mine. Nice. And people write their phone numbers on discs, but for some reason, I didn't understand the common courtesy of calling somebody and giving them their thing back so i just kept it <laughs> and that disc has now been lost again on a different park somewhere else so it can't even return to the guy um but uh the, i always tell people that there's nothing more satisfying than watching the flight of a disc there is something yeah. just so uh smooth and satisfying about watching that fly through the air and that it came from your hand i don't know maybe it's like when people fall in love with like tennis or baseball or skateboarding or any other esports even yeah um, you know like counter-strike i'm a big pc gamer playing counter-strike there's nothing more satisfying than hitting a good headshot yeah call of so, duty any of that kind of stuff so yeah, do you yeah, resent yeah. the term frisbee I, I notice you're calling it discs all the time do you do you resent the term frisbee no i think uh and there are like 
there's always elitists about anything anywhere. So like a lot of the disc golfers will call golf ball golf because it's oh, not sorry. disc golf. It's ball golf. <laughs> I like, I love disc golf, but golf had it first, you know, golf was golf before golf was golf, disc yeah. golf was a thing. Right. So I, I'm, I'm not like that at all, but uh, I'm, I'm trying to imagine what an elitist disc golfer looks like. <laughs> oh, Hey, I used to play, I played for about a, about 10 years back in the day in really santa, santa cruz yeah are i have a whole serious right now oh dead serious i have a whole bag around here somewhere are you serious um, what did you have a favorite disc what did you throw uh you know i don't recall what they are oh, uh, right my back. friend bought me he some bought. some uh i have a putter the putter's kind of the kind of the heavier floppier one and then um driver like they have kind of the same things as actual golf clubs Do you guys have um, a roby oh nothing no nothing like that dude my mine has like five in it yeah like, i have wow. a shelf with about 20 or 30 more discs in it because i like to change on my bag so i have you know these are these are putters here my yeah. two main putters these are throwing putters right yeah. here yeah. i have all my drivers in here and then i have yeah. my mid-range discs here yes um, so this Do you guys have a Roby? Do you know what a Roby is? Yeah. Uh, those? those were some of the I think the earliest discs. And then um yeah, and then companies actually started like uh Innova or uh, Discraft. Um those guys have been making discs for a long time, but a Roby they and uh you know, Whammo too. Those those guys were making um I forgot what they called them. They were like frisbee golf discs or something. Well, and Arobis were super cool because they were they were like the ones we had up here are super super thin, and you can get them in a triangle or a circle, but they're super thin, and then they have a little groove carved out the bottom of them to make them extra like aerodynamic. And we could take them like there's a lake uh, like 20 minutes away from me called Sylvan Lake, and we would take these things out in the water, and they're really bad to play with in the water because they float really well, but they fly so well that you could throw them almost entirely across the lake because they just fly forever, and they're a lot of fun. The triangular ones especially for some reason could fly like the dickens but are you talking about like the rings yeah with the little with the little groove cut out the bottom yeah i th threw one of the, i hadn't thrown one of those in a while and this was about a year or two after i was seriously playing disc golf and after i'd gotten the throw and the form down and uh i threw one of those and it went so far right i wasn't used to throwing you know a frisbee like how you throw a disc before yeah um, and you you just left it you're like, I'm not going to go. Do that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was That's in the backyard. So. Screw that. Yeah. Oh, you throw them, and okay. then you, when you realize you can't get them back, you're just like, well, I guess I'll go get it. Whatever. Drink. I'm just going to yeah, buy another. There's, there's $29 buy down an... the drain. Yeah. Right. I'm just going to buy another one. I'm going to pour one more drink, and then we'll play the game. Okay. I can't even get in this conversation. I worked in Parks and Rec for a while, and I found a disc golf. Oh, that's cool. I found a disc, oh. and now my cat eats out of it. Out of the yeah. garage. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a phone number on it? No, it's orange though. It's um, not that helps. So what's our game, Cole? Okay, so symbols with Kit. Kit, uh, going back to that episode about the uh, Boston find and the conversation you guys had about it, um, you were talking about symbolism, and that was probably my favorite part of that particular conversation because it, it's it's talking to you as an artist, not necessarily as you know, the son of JJP or the maker of the tribute or any of that kind of stuff. It's it's talking about you and your opinions as an artist. So I want to talk about some symbols. And in that conversation, you mentioned how like in, you know, old paintings and stuff like that, if there was a lady with her hand behind her arm, uh, it usually symbolized prostitutes or sorry, her arm behind her head. Um, it symbolized prostitutes or a lady who was like ready to go kind of thing. Uh, for you, dogs were a symbol of loyalty. And so um, the game is we're each going to give you three uh, nouns, just to use the most basic term, as symbols, none of which are in the tribute image. So none of this has to do, like none of it's going to give away anything from the tribute or anything like that, hopefully. Um, but, and we want to know what, if you were to put these, things into a painting, what would they symbolize to you as, as an artist? Like, if, what would the symbolism be of these particular things, okay? Okay, okay. So this is the game. You're gonna Who show me pictures? That? No, we're just gonna give you the words, oh. and you can, if you were to put X into a picture, what would that thing symbolize? Okay. You dig? Okay. 
George, you go first. I'm going to cheat. <laughs> I'm going to cheat and use something that you put in a lot of your paintings just because I'm curious about it. Barns. What, what does this mean? Yeah, what, 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 you put barns in a lot of your paintings. What does that I symbolize do. to you? The, the barns symbolize a... Uh, this is really interesting because a, a lot of people don't really maybe ask the artist directly about what certain things mean or nobody has directly asked me before. Um, barns symbolize this decaying generation um a, a generation that is past but is still very much there and it just happens to be the uh, midwestern ohio landscape and i've done many projects about many paintings fewer fewer projects than paintings about these barns and it got to a point where i was doing all these landscape paintings that were very much inspired by andrew wyeth and edward hopper two of my favorite artists uh i would go up to different houses that were really old or had barns and i would ask the people like hey can i take some pictures or stay and do a sketch of whatever and i would have some really interesting conversations with the people and the the one conversation that i had with somebody one day they lived in a schoolhouse that was very close to uh one of the main roads that goes through medina and hinkley and um uh, just a couple counties in Ohio. And I remember I had, uh, cause it's weird when people like knock on your door now, you know, you never get out and knock on somebody's door. Uh, walked up and she opened the door and I, you know, tried to be as creepy as possible. I knock and then take like five steps back to let them know I was not, you know, a complete stranger. <laughs> and I had, was asking her about the house and if I could, you know, take some photos. I'm a landscape artist, you know, here's my business card. I showed her some images on my phone of like what I did. She told me a story about the house, how it was a uh, hundred year old schoolhouse. And, you know, there was a big barn in the back that was really interesting. And she let me go around the property and take photos. And I did a, a few paintings that have since sold uh, watercolor landscapes, they're, they're gone. Um, but I also did a couple projects about land being sacred and uh, the sense of um, like the ground that you are on or the ground that you are from that you recognize as home. Is that sacred ground? Is it sacred to you? Do other people feel just as sacred as you do when you are stepping onto this land? And so I did this project about this house. I did these paintings and I remember I had moved out of my parents' house, so I wasn't around, you know, these landscapes anymore. And I lived in Kent, I, I lived in Akron, and, but sometimes I would go back and play the disc golf courses in Medina. So I'd always drive through the same area. And if I, especially if I went to my parents' house, I would drive by where this house was. And one day the house was gone. And so was the barn. And oh, wow. then a few months later, it was a development and, you know, every house looked the same and this has happened. Now I went down uh, another road in Medina. This was just a couple weeks ago. And there were several barns that I have pictures of in my reference that are no longer, they've been completely demolished, torn down to make way for new highways, new developments. And so the barns symbolize this, um, generation, the sense of nostalgia, the sense of um, what's there that some people might not have noticed, but they never will now. So it's like if a tree falls in the woods, do you hear it? Well, yes and no. Um, I'm going to pick something more mundane, a hubcap. <laughs> I said stuff that's not in the tribute image. How do you know <laughs> that that's... That's true, that's very true. Why didn't you let him react? Right, it, it could be, you know, a shield or something. Who a knows? gear. Um, what, but what if what if you hubcap. did put a hubcap in a painting? What what would that symbolize to you? Oh man, all, all sorts of hubcaps are different. I've never really done an automotive painting before, um, but a hubcap to me would mean, um, I don't know something uh shiny something reflective uh a hubcap could mean some sort of travel or 
a, a collectible of some sorts. I think people collect all sorts of things. I'm definitely a collector. Uh, I collect disc golf. I, I collect uh, uh, video games. I collect uh, um, replica firearms, airsoft guns, you know, stuff like that. Um, and but people collect license plates. People collect all sorts of things. Uh, so that's what it would mean to me, I think, is just a collection. Is that awesome? Answer? Awesome answer. Okay. All right. Yep. Yep. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to give you a choice. I got two, and you just get to pick one and go with it. I want either a bicycle or an untied shoe. I'd pick the bicycle. Okay. I think that, uh, man, a bicycle and a painting symbolizes a a growth or a transition or um almost a coming of age i think that bicycles everybody knows how to ride a bike it's that's why there's that saying it's like riding a bike you can just yeah. pick it right up and learn how to do it again and everybody starts on you know a tricycle with training wheels and then you bump up to something else and then you keep going up until you're riding a mountain bike and um so I'd, i would uh the bicycle is a really cool thing. That's another really cool subject to paint and work from. I don't know if uh, the Rhode Island School of Design or RISD for short still does it, but one of their application procedures was you had to submit a drawing or your, just a drawing or a painting of a bike, bicycle. Like, how do you? Wow. So, and that's how they admit you into the, the program. Wow. I don't know if they still do that or not, but you get all sorts of different bicycles that, that people would design different abstract artists different realist artists different sculpture majors or glass artists or metal smiths you know all sorts but, of different. Uh, the tv show brain games did an experiment once where they asked people to draw bicycles from memory and then they would try to build them and see if they actually would be functional bikes and like 75 percent of the time they absolutely could not function as a bicycle does the way people drew them right really i feel yeah, like i could would... draw a bike out of my head right now and it, yeah, yeah. function well, yeah, I hear wheels. But these are just people on the street that they talk to. But there was a uh, an old TV show. I forgot what channel it was on. It was called Junkyard Wars, and mm -hmm. there would be different teams of people, and they would go into the junkyard, and they would have to build a a certain type of vehicle out of pieces from the junkyard. And that was really, really cool. There was there's a question like a, a two deep artistic questions just to get in the mind of an artist that I've always been curious about. And I tried to ask your dad once one of them and he absolutely wouldn't answer me. It was about his painting ghost punch. Do you know which one I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to look it up right now. So I know what you're talking about. That is absolutely my favorite painting he's ever done. And it means so much to me that it probably absolutely does not mean to him. But art's like that. Once, once you, pr you produce art and it means something to you and you put it out in the world, and it means something completely different to everybody else. Um, as an artist, uh, does that, do you feel that the, the, that a painting that you create, does, does the, the meaning behind that ever change because of public perception? Or do you always hold, to, to you, does the painting always mean the same thing or does it ever change because of public perception? I think that that is part of it being an artist is being able to, to defend your work if the situation ever arises. I think that, at least for me, there are paintings where pretty much every piece of art I ever do, um, it, it means something and it will never, nobody will ever tell me that it means anything different. That's the interesting thing about uh, perception and interpretation is that you get so many different interpretations about one piece of art. And that's the beauty of art too, is that you can think whatever you want about a piece of art, but the only, it's like a magician, you know, they're the only ones who knows the, knows the secret to their routine or their yeah. illusions that they do. Would you agree that from, from an artist's perspective, that an artist's interpretation of their emotions um, becomes the viewer's interpretation of the work that we do. Like you say that, you know, and I agree 100% that when you make a piece of art, it means this thing to you, or like it has this meaning for you as the artist, and that will never change, right? Um, 
but sometimes viewers interpret things differently than the artists originally intended. Uh, is that a result of the fact that they don't like they themselves may not be artists and can't see why you give the meaning you do to these works, or is it also because like viewers experiences with art is subjective in the same way that an artist's uh, view of their own work is subjective, correct? I think it's absolutely suggestive about uh, how a viewer interprets a piece of work versus like, I don't <laughs> interpret, um, I, I think any artist would interpret another artist's piece of work completely different than that artist interprets their own work. Uh, okay. I think that um, I interpret Andrew Wyeth's work differently than he interprets his own work. I was going to ask about in his world. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's, there's certain things that I might not even notice that an artist put into their work, or I might be missing certain obvious symbols. For example, Ghost Punch, those little round uh guys. yeah those are um halloween decorations that my mom hung in um the, the very first house that i remember growing up in and i'm lucky to have the smile that i do because when my mom was hanging these halloween decorations the brakes on my stroller i guess failed or something and i rolled forward down the porch and there were three steps and I tipped over frontwards and I went down three steps and then my face and mouth, you know, smashed into the, the sidewalk below. And I was very young. I think I was three or four. And um, I, I don't know if I cried or not, but she lifted up my top lip and my teeth were like gone and my gums were all black and blue. And they were like, you know, worried I wasn't going to have any front teeth. And so those little ball things are from i think that that day they were halloween decorations they were little ghosts wow but, uh, so I, I don't know i interpret that painting totally different than how you you're, interpret it george <clears throat> you're and the it, one that got the ghost punch i guess that was me <laughs> right, pushed me down the stairs right to the kisser <laughs> yeah, I heard myself by them ghosts. art is obviously your passion but you seem to have uh, another passion for uh teaching others to um create art um, improving their skills and improving, um, not improving, but changing the way they approach art, maybe. Um, you spent a lot of time teaching. You've taught at Canton School of the Arts. Did you teach at Akron as well? Or not uh, Canton School of the Arts, Canton Museum, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, and did you teach at Akron? I, I'm teaching at Akron right now. The, the world's full of people who love your art, but they can't necessarily just up and go to Akron. Um, do you have any plans in the future of maybe doing some like online teaching, online tutoring, um, anything like that? Absolutely. In fact, I've just opened up a Patreon page where uh, if you subscribed to even just my base tier level, the tier one, which I think is uh, $15 a month, if you subscribe to that, you will get access to... Um, any sort of drawing or painting demonstration video that I make in my studio. And my hopes are to create lessons and workshops and uh, tutorial videos for people who um, want to see the world differently. I, a lot of my teaching philosophy is based off of not just teaching people how to draw better or, or you know, draw, learn how to draw an eye or something, but how to see the world differently. I know that a, a non-artist looks at a tree differently than how I look at a tree. When I look at a tree, I think of all these different positive and negative shapes between the leaves and the branches. I think about composition. I, I, that's why I love dead trees so much. There's something about things that are dead. I, I don't know. I do a lot of skulls. I do a lot of dead trees, a lot of derelict barns that are falling apart. Um, I, I think that they just create such interesting shapes. But you tell a person who's not an artist to look at a tree or like some of my disc golf buddies who are not artists are like, why are you taking a picture of that tree? And I was like, well, it looks really fucking looks cool. Um, 
And so the, these classes that I'm going to be launching, these demonstrations are going to be about how to see the world differently, not just how to represent it, but how to see it differently. So that's, uh, that's something that's going to be coming very soon. But, th but they're not just like static um, classes. They're interactive, right? People will be able to interact with you during these. Well, there are some that are going to be pre-recorded videos where it's a demonstration about um, one of the first videos that I'm going to launch is going to be about line and how simple a line can be and how effective a line can be and how to handle line and how to draw with just line. Um, and those are going to be pre-recorded and posted, um, but there can always be discussions had. I, th I think either I can have like a comment section or a blog and then the next tier up on my Patreon, you will get access to uh, a weekly stream where every, I don't know what day, I haven't decided that yet, um, but let's say every Friday night, I stream from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. That is something that you can join and watch me paint. You can have a discussion with me. You can type in the chat. You can ask me all sorts of questions about, hey, how do you do this, you know? and or uh, uh, why are you doing that? Or what is what are you working on today? Or uh, hey, what's this weird rash on my belly? You know, and <laughs> we'll have a nice conversation about uh, anything. So, <laughs> what's but not the, the tribute, uh, right? What was that? But not the tribute. Um, I don't know. I, I'm not. I'm not putting any rules on anything. I don't want it to be just talk about you know, That's the right. tribute or the secret. And I, no. I hope that uh, people realize that too. Um, because so. generally when you go into streams like this, it's not just, it's not focused on art. It's, it's, there's a lot of just bullshitting with people. There's yeah. A lot of just conversation, which is the fun part of these streams. Like, it's not just, this is how you paint a flower. Like it's, it's yeah. a lot of just having a conversation with kids. There are a lot of videos that I've been watching online of people who have done video demonstrations and different classes, and they are so boring. Like yeah. there's either like no talking yeah. or um, there's there's no energy behind it. And so I'm hoping to do something completely opposite of that. Yes, I Paul. have a request for Kit for one of your classes. Can you do a, a class on painting with white watercolor? There is no such thing as white watercolor. There, I well, <laughs> I mean, there kind of is, but there kind of isn't. It, it, very light gray. <laughs> yeah. There is, uh, that's a really interesting thing to talk about is, uh, I, I don't, it's like um, a lot of people don't believe in like using black in paintings or something like that. Right. Um, I don't believe in using white watercolor. Uh, it depends on, I guess, the, the mood or um, what the painting is, but I think that being able to think about the white of the paper as the white paint is a lot more rewarding. It shows a lot more confidence. It shows a lot more knowledge in what you're doing when you're applying the watercolor. You have to think about um, layering it up you have to think about okay this is going to be the white of the paper i need to not put any paint here or watch my washes you know watch any splattering um because the watercolor is kind of like a stain like if you ever notice when you do a drawing do you watercolor over top of that you can still erase your pencil drawing because it stains the paper more than actually putting something over top of something else so you're a big negative space guy <laughs> yeah oh, yeah so this is why we have to sign up for your patreon is to yes. hear about all sorts of stuff like this because i i yes. will sign up i will sign up yeah, uh, yeah. What is sure. the address? Have you said the address already? Like, what is um, the... No, I wanted to wait until uh, I had something to give because right now it's okay. totally empty. There's nothing on there, and uh, I don't want to, you know, start. I've already taken money from George, and he's got nothing in return. He signed up. He was the first first patron to my Patreon. Thank you, George. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> um, uh, so well, I want to uh, wait until I can get something posted on there before I release release it. Yeah, and we'll post it in the comments below the video or in the description and it'll be around. Let's say yeah. like we, we've talked about it like it's uh, for artists, but non-artists or beginner artists would get a lot out of this too, right? Like when I went, I, I sat in on one of your classes in, in Canton 
and it was very beginner high school artists. You were teaching them about uh, how to properly use shadows. So I'm assuming um, that either non-artists or beginner artists would be able to get out of get a lot out of this as well. In addition to just having conversations with kids. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of my instruction and years spent teaching, I've taught it um, now three different colleges and um, one museum. Um, I've done little one-off classes before for different um, uh, different groups, different student groups. Uh, I've done like a wine and sip and paint kind of type thing. Anyway, cool. uh, a lot of my instruction is based around you know, more beginner stuff, but there are techniques that can be utilized by a lot of, you know, more advanced people. Sometimes the advanced people think they know everything, but they don't. And I'm not saying I know everything. I just know a different way to do things. Um, so it's like uh, the movie, I don't know if I'm, we're gonna get copyrighted here, but Ratatouille, when the guy says anyone can cook, in that heavy, thick Italian accent, I say the same thing about drawing. I think anybody can draw. You just have to free your mind, like the Matrix, you know, and mm -hmm. Morpheus tells Neo to <laughs> free his mind. The result of that for some people is going to be worse than others. I mean, you want me to free my mind and start drawing stuff? And it's not. It's not going to be very good. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just being honest with you, which is why I would sign up for your Patreon because I want to hear that was cool. What you said about like thinking about things like spatially. One of the things that I like about Patreon is it's, it's, it's kind of passive. It's, it's a way to support um, people who are doing things that you like, right? You don't necessarily have to be active in it. You don't necessarily have to like um, be active in the streams. Like the, the podcast has a Patreon, but we don't give anything you get nothing from joining it essentially it's just a way to support the creators that 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 you whose work you enjoy it's a way to help kit buy groceries kind of so you sign up and it's like 10 15 bucks and then every month you give 10 or 15 bucks to kit and it allows them to keep making art yeah it pays for uh uh supplies it pays for new canvas brushes um gas to you know continue teaching um, at, at colleges and universities and um, it's just a way to support me also if you uh, let's say you know you don't want to buy a painting or a drawing or something this is another way to to support me in my my art and you get something out of it too you get a, a lecture you get a class you get a demonstration you get to hang out with me on a stream um, you might even get uh, a, a print or something for free if you sign up for a higher level. You get to suggest ideas for uh, paintings. So you get something too out of it. As a guitar player, I've always said that the only thing better than, than listening to a song is knowing how to play it. And I think that applying that to what Kit's doing, uh, you know, like the only thing better than knowing how to, or like then seeing art by artists that you love is knowing how they do it. Right. And if somebody can go to these or watch these classes and, you know, support Kit and learn, you know, and walk away being a better artist in some way, shape or form, that's exactly the same thing. You know what I mean? Like it's 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 learning how to be better by people that how, have been there. Right. And there's so many different ways to do things, too. <clears throat> I think that uh, I, I have learned a lot from my dad about his techniques, but he is such a private solitary artist you know he sits in his studio and he locks all the doors and he shuts the steel curtains on his windows and <laughs> you know uh but i uh, i enjoy having others be able to create things and they can take what you know i teach and do whatever they want with it they can twist it they can tweak it uh maybe they do it a different way um and that's that's the beauty of art but let's say people want to take it a step further because we were talking earlier. You said, let's say you don't want to buy a painting. Let's say you do. Let's say somebody wants to buy a painting from you. Uh, your paintings are for sale. I'm assuming people just yes, have to get yes. in touch with you. Um, and you were also talking about doing prints. We talked earlier about doing a print of the tribute painting. Are you going to do prints of any of your other paintings? Um, yes. The ones that are still left that uh, uh, I can actually get good 
photographs of. I think uh, I, I have some photographs that are not too good of paintings that are now sold and in different states or countries. Uh, but for instance, this painting of a tea bag, which is one of the tiers on my Patreon, it is the first tier, the tea bag tier. Um, this painting has sold, but I plan on doing prints of this. So if you'd like to uh, purchase a print of this, they will be available soon. And those are things that I could, you know, sell on, on Patreon or, or prints of any other painting uh, that I'll do in the future. Prints of the tribute painting are going to yeah, be available. I, I think we're going to, we're going to put some on the merch store for 12 treasures. So if you go down there, go to 12 treasures, go to the merch store. Hopefully by the time this comes out, some will be there. Who knows? Thank you. I would like Thank a print of that the grave. That's my favorite kit palancar. I even highlighted it in my notes. Oh man, Happy maybe I'll grave. just sell you the original. <laughs> do you still have it? I thought it said it was. Sold. I do. It's only uh, that's a very. I think it, I don't know if it's still framed or not, but that's a very small painting. It's a uh, maybe a, a little bit larger than a postcard. Oh um, yeah, okay. The companion piece to that is uh, called Dog Run, right? And um, that is kind of a very similar theme, but it's about uh, my late dog, um, Kimmy. And we always had a, a, we had a dog run, which is like a big line that you hook up to two trees and it's like, I don't know, a hundred feet. And then you can attach a 30 foot leash to that. So they can just run up and down your yard. We yeah. always had it, we never hooked it up for. Um, and so that was a, a painting about, about that. And now we know what to get Cole for Christmas. Oh, uh. <laughs> that's a big painting and it's on paper too. Oh uh, no, the so smaller roll one. It up. Oh, the yeah. small one. Okay. All right. I'll go. I'll go get it. I know where it is. I've I've learned how much the tribute painting would cost. I can't afford the big ones. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I I guess that's all. Unless there's something else that you guys that kid is there something else you wanted to talk about or something else we missed? Are you hinting at something? Should I be talking about something? No, I'm just curious if there was anything you wanted to talk about that we we skipped over or didn't uh, hit. I don't. Uh... I don't think so. I'm just here to answer questions and kick ass and chew bubble gum. And I'm not quite out of gum yet, so. Can you play Resident Evil at all? Did I play Resident Evil? Uh, I haven't bought any of the new ones. I have Resident Evil 4. I've always loved 4 because I remember yeah. playing it on a uh, Nintendo GameCube with one of my lifelong friends, Evan. And I remember that guy with the bag on his head just cutting right. my yeah, fucking yeah. head off with the chainsaw and it was yeah he was always was chasing you yeah dude they um they made a controller for playstation based on that um chainsaw really it's like a chainsaw yeah. controller yeah it's super you expensive. have that don't you no i don't it's one of my like white whales i've never found right. it. i've got i got two playstation controllers i want it's that one and the wu-tang clan made a game and they made a playstation controller shaped like the wu-tang logo and nice. I can't find either of them. That oh, that's great. Rad. <laughs> I, would, I would pay a lot of money for either of those things. <laughs> but yeah, well, it's if, really... that's what I keep saying about games. If they go on sale, I'll buy them. Because I bought the last, uh, I don't know about you, but I think the quality of games has just gone. It's gone downhill. Really, really downhill. Like the last good game that came out, I think, that I played was either Call of Duty Modern Warfare, like the one that came out in 2019, or. Um, mm -hmm doom or doom eternal and that was you know a few years ago now at this point because i bought the new call of duty and i bought the new battlefield like i uh i think i had pre-ordered them or something and i remember i returned both of them within a few days i was like this is i'm incredibly bored there it's full of bugs it's not even finished and now uh i don't know battlefield for instance, is now considering going free to play because they've burned so many people on yeah. what people thought they were getting. So oh, that's really? what I was worried about Far Cry 6. So it's nice to hear that it actually can get a little good. See, I, I hate multiplayer games. I just hate them. I, I don't like playing with people online. I don't want my gaming experience dependent on whether or not somebody's a dick. You yeah. Know? yeah. I always tell people I like to play with myself. <laughs> I, I like story-based <laughs> games and Far Cry 6 is a is a story-based game. It has some co-op, which is cool. I haven't tried yet, but um, yeah, the story is good. 
but like it might not be a game for you because you're more of like a run and gun first person shooter kind of guy and i'm i play first person shooters as like the sniper role um there are different games where so the run and gun get like first person shooters to me there are some that really push for like this competitive uh like pubg gameplay well pubg yeah. is still a little arcadey to me i i'm when i think of like competitive first person shooters i think of counter-strike and call of duty like these 5v5 6v6 head-to-head games where there's an objective and you're working with really smart people on your team and really smart people and it's just a game of who can outsmart and who can manipulate who around the map differently and get the upper hand and then there are games that i play like far cry 2 if you've never played far cry 2 I will it's send a you. No, a yeah, copy. I've got it. I've got it. I'll send you an exe file because I turned off the music in that game, and I just like, and I play Far Cry Two, and I get into this, like, I immerse myself with this African landscape, and you'll hear like gazelles like chirping off in the distance, and you can hear the wind going through the trees, and so there are games that I can play. Like Far Cry, Crisis, uh, these open world games where you just fall out. You know, I love Fallout yeah. 3. Oh, dude, I'm, uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge Fallout fan. Yeah, you just get so enveloped in exploration. And uh, so there's there's some times when I really am craving that, like, I'm going to get really pissed when I play a first person. And then there's the times when I really just want to relax and, you know, disappear to another world for a little bit where yeah. you know there's there's a lot going on I, i'm working like three jobs right now about to start four and um sometimes i, I need a break from that, life yeah neither do i, I. Uh, that's why i'm trying to get rid of the the one job and just teach and have you know patreon so hopefully it works i hope, I hope so too and i i hope to uh, i can't wait to sign up I pay into two Patreons right now. One is for the Pacific Northwest Stories podcast, and the other is the Satanic Temple. Lucy and Greaves has a has a has a Patreon, and and I pay into that because I like listening to him talk. Nice. But, but if you have a Patreon, like I, I, that's why I was asking the link earlier, is because if it's there, I'll fucking I'll start I'll paying send it. in. I'll but, send it to you. Yeah, please do, and I'll start buying in and and whatever, but. I pay into one I, like, Patreon currently. <laughs> yeah. I want to, like, I want to talk to Kit. Like, if you look in the community, a lot of people want to talk to Kit Palancar because they want to know answers to the tribute, right? I, I've i seen the tribute stuff, and I've seen now also what Kit Palancar does as an artist, and that's the stuff I want to get into, right? Like, when I first got into watercolor, my <laughs> wife bought me, for my very first Father's Day, she bought me a, a set of really high-end watercolor tools, right? Paints, brushes, things like that, uh, and paper. Like, that was the one thing that I didn't really ever put much credence into was the kind of paper you're painting on, right? But it's an incredible it, difference. In oh, paper. fuck, man, it's massive. Like, what I use right now is, uh, I think it's just mixed medium paper, but it's basically watercolor that you can just pencil on kind of thing, right? Like, it's uh -huh. still very porous and, and what have you. But... You know, uh, what's shocking to me about learning how to watercolor paint was actually how how easy it was in comparison to how easy I thought it would be, right? Like, I didn't think it was going to be easy at all. But then once you really start to look at, like, blending and the amount of water you're using and, and like, dry brush, I've gotten so big into dry brush watercolor painting. Like, all my backgrounds in my original art is is just dry brush painting, right? And, you know, those sort of things are really, really fun. So I want to learn more techniques from other artists, right? And that's a great way to do it. Watercolor was one of the first things that I learned. Uh, and God, I don't know where it is. I actually, I feel like there was some sort of talk about seeing my first watercolor painting. Um, oh, shit. That was a question somebody wanted me to ask and I forgot. Fuck. I do. I just thought about that now. I, I think it's... Well, let's do it and record a little extra bit that you can put on. I don't know that I can. Uh, I can. I can record an OBS. All right, I'm recording an OBS. What does that stand for? Uh... OBS, Open Broadcast Software. Oh. Um. Shit. And there was a trivia question I wanted to ask, but I just thought of it now. I got a super depressing question I want to ask it. It's very depressing. Kid, I have an image question that I wanted yeah, to ask yeah, during yeah. during the thing, but <laughs> forgot to. Um, Get off the depressing have, part. 
do you have a favorite part of the tribute image? Like, is there something in there that you look at and you're just like, God damn, that's fucking rad. You know what I mean? Like, um, it's, it's probably just going to be like, yes, I can't tell you what it is. <laughs> that's fine. I just want to know if you have things like that or is it just like an overall, I dig this picture. fucking painting is um <laughs> I, I gotta i gotta go out in the other room and look for um or something hey kelly kelly's like you still talking to your nerd friends yeah i think she's my favorite part of the tribute painting um what? she was the uh the model for it so oh um that's cute yeah we don't have to tell anyone that no that's uh that's okay uh but, um, you know, I like how ambiguous people's interpretations are of, you know, people think it's like an American Indian, you know, or the, the face is a little bit different. There are certain things that are, you know, distorted that, um, you know, maybe reference something else. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, like the uh, when uh, Dustin's thing, he had those pictures of the painting, like progress pictures of the painting. And somebody had noticed that there was... Um, like you had painted over top of something, I think on, on the, like on the final board or something like that. And yeah, you yeah. mentioned in the comments, you're like, yeah, that was, that was like an old piece of like canvas or something I had drawn on and I'm just painting over top of it. But somebody wanted to make that into a clue essentially. Yeah, that was, that was kind of funny. Um, that the original piece of art that was done, I was experimenting with uh, wood panels and using graphite powder and i would take ebony pencils because they're super soft mm -hmm. and i would grind them down on sandpaper to get a bunch of dust and you could buy graphite powder in like a jar but it was like incredibly expensive and super rare i couldn't find it anywhere so i would grind these pencils down on sandpaper and i would take a um here, here's here's one that i've used it used to be white <laughs> uh, but i would take it and dip it in graphite powder and then i would draw with this and i would block in a, a area with it and then i'd go back in with erasers and i'd go back in with turpentine and a brush and the turpentine would break apart the graphite and make it really spreadable um almost That's like an sweet. oil paint and so the the painting that was originally on there was like this girl sitting in a chair on in a enclosed patio smoking a, a cigarette and that's cool I so you basically were painting with pencil yeah, next, yeah, yeah. Next time I have an art question, I'm just going to ask you instead of trying to ask your dad. Because I tried to ask your dad, I was doing this drawing, and I tried to ask your dad how to do essentially what you just said. I had to fill an entire page full of graphite quickly without just, like, scribbling on the page and then blending it all out. And he was like, I don't know, I can't help you. He's like, sometimes maybe just powder graphite, whatever. I did this. <laughs> I did that, like, forever yeah. ago. And I was like, I, I can't figure out how to, I was like, I don't know how to do it without ruining my pencils. And he was like, well, oh. I'll, I'll tell you a story. So <laughs> there was a drawing that I did of my hand and it's, it's pretty much, the drawing just looks like, like this. It's my hand like this and it's yeah. cropped right here like this. And I wanted the, the hand to be very detailed. So I spent a lot of time on the hand, but the thing that consumed the most amount of time, this drawing took about 12 hours to do. The thing that consumed about uh, seven or eight of the hours was meticulously using an ebony pencil to color the entire background in black. And my hand, you know, would cramp up severely. So sometimes you just like, Sometimes, you, just Sometimes you do something with graphite powder and it looks really like rushed or, you know, lazy. And then some things you do with graphite powder where it's like, yeah, that works in the application. And then sometimes you just need to f fucking bite the bullet and take <laughs> your time and be patient and put on some music and just zonk yourself out and, yeah. you know, get this thing done. Yeah. So, but that's not me, man. Anything that I do doesn't take more than a couple hours. Like I don't have the patience for it. I, I, I almost do speed drawing. It's weird. Uh, -huh. So I think my dad, when he does, um, he'll do sketches for an illustration and the sketches look completely different from what he sends to, uh, the publisher or whoever is commissioning this piece of art for an illustration. So I think he will either photograph or scan his, um, 
images in and then edit them in Photoshop. He'll inverse certain colors. Uh, so that way, you know, if there's, if you ever see one of his drawings and there's a big gray area in the background, well, he might've pulled it into Photoshop and inversed it or colored it in gray or something and then uh, edited the photo. And then that's what he sends off to people. Hmm. That's so cool. Uh, Gentlemen, I gotta disappear. Okay, I'll go ahead and right. end everything and Kit, let you get back to your girlfriend and stuff. Thanks, okay. man, for coming on. I'll get this yeah, no edited. Um, I'll get this edited the next this week sometime, and I'll get it sent to you just to make sure there's nothing in it that you don't want in there. And then, like I said, we'll throw it out on the 14th. Wow, I, um, that's fucking insane, dude. I did never like expected any of this, and I, I never have expected any of these podcasts or talks with anybody it's insanely humbling and i uh, to to be able to talk with you guys about this kind of stuff and brett and cole thanks and, and george thank you for asking all these questions and, and shit about process about art about um the tribute about the the secret how little i know about it and mm -hmm. um it's I, I really appreciate you guys for everything that you do even just like looking or hunting for the the tribute is is all the, the the support I need. Hey man, as a key searcher, I think I speak for a lot of people when when I say thanks for coming out and doing this very thing. Like, you know, um, JM's not around to be with you to do it. You know, and so I imagine it probably was a little bit tricky to come out and and talk about it with us. And like, obviously, if this part doesn't belong in the podcast, don't put it there. I'm just speaking from the people that I that I've spoken to and stuff like that. And you know, a lot of people are really fucking excited about this conversation we just had. So you know, thank you. I just want to say thanks as an artist for coming out and and being willing to talk about your processes and stuff like that and just your experiences. Yeah, you're welcome. Let's hey. Toast to John, too. Thank you, John. Cheers to John. Fuck yeah.